Well, good morning to our brothers and sisters at the James River campus and to Pastor Mac and those of you in person here at the Buford Road campus. And to those of you online, thank you for making this time a time of worship for you and Sabbath in your homes. God is good in all the time. And if you've enjoyed worship wherever you are, why don't you thank the Lord for the great talents and spirit that He's brought into worship. Let Him hear you for that. Absolutely. Living in Roanoke, Virginia and raising our girls there, we had a family favorite dog for, I don't know, 10 or 11 years. And as it happens, those favorite dogs pass away. And as it happens, you grieve that dog, and then after a while, you begin to have a conversation. We need another dog. And so on a whim, I thought about calling a friend of mine. His name is Roger. He lives in the mountains of North Carolina, and he raised beagles. Now, I'm not just talking about any kind of beagles. I'm talking about hunting, vehicle, hunting beagles that had the highest pedigree from the American Kennel Association. The going rate for one of his pups was in the thousands of dollars. And so on a crazy whim, and I just thought, well, I'll call him. Maybe he'd be willing to give me one. So I called him. He said, absolutely. He didn't even hesitate. He said, come on up. I've got the specific pup just for you. And so as I arrived, we began to walk out in the backyard, and I could hear them before I could see them. They're beagle pups, right? They're yapping and hollering and, uh, you know, as they're, as they're known to, to do, just make all kinds of noise. And he walks up to the fence there and he lets them loose and they just all come running out as a pack. They're going crazy, howling in the yard and I'm excited and I'm following this pack and I holler, Roger, which one's for me? Roger does like this. He said, no, 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 no. These are the highest pedigree. They will go to the highest bidder. There is yours. And I turned around and I looked at the pen. And here he came, tail tucked between his legs, crawling along the ground as if he had been beaten all whatever three months of his life. And Roger starts laughing and says, that one is yours. Nothing but the best for you, Tom. The runt of the litter. And of course, so began an 18-year love affair with Buddy, the runt of the litter. He was the perfect dog for us. But when you think about the runt, you usually think about the smallest of the litter, the weakest of the litter, uh, the one who really is kind of seen with uh, contempt and compared by standards of strength and agility and beauty of the others just does not match up. And so the description, the term is given to that one, the runt of the litter. Well, as we continue in our series on the heroes of our faith, we're looking at those heroes of our faith and the ancestry of the Bible, uh, those to whom we are descendants of, and in looking at their story, stories of the heritages of faith, their life stories point us to God. When we look at them, we see their achievements tell us something about the characteristic of God. These are individuals who have noble qualities and actions that really kind of tell us about a deep-rooted faithfulness that we can learn from. And so today, the hero of our faith is a runt. His name is David. You've been hearing some about the context because I think the story of his calling really has multitudes to say about God's calling on your life and on my life. And I'm not just talking about a calling. I'm talking about callings, plural, throughout our life. The context here is that while Saul is still the king, Samuel the judge is called by God to go uh, to, to uh, uh, Bethlehem and to see Jesse and to find the next king. Well, well Samuel's scared to death. He thinks Saul's going to kill me, but he obeys. And so he makes his way uh, to the home of Jesse, which is in Bethlehem. Bethlehem, ring a, be ring a bell? That's, that's where Jesus is born. Not only that, Jesse is a farmer and a sheep breeder. How many times do we hear about Jesus being the shepherd? And so Samuel arrives on the scene and there he calls for a sacrifice and a celebration of consecration. Consecration really is a kind of a setting apart. It's a, a celebration of blessing upon those who are a part of it who were willing to spiritually set aside themselves with their heart, mind, body, soul, and strength, every bit of them. And so he does a sacrifice and this consecration service and then following the ceremony, he begins to look over the sons of Jesse. Samuel sees Eliab, and automatically he says, Surely, 
Surely the Lord's anointed one stands before us. In other words, in all of his glory and honor, it would have made sense. Eliab was, well, would have been a natural fit. He's the oldest in the family. Therefore, he's the, the heir to the family. He stands as the leader of the family right under his father here. It said he was tall and dark and handsome and strong, and so it's a natural fit, right? Not so. Not so because God then begins to let Samuel in on God's decision-making process. How does God choose to call out someone? So the Lord says to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or height, for I've rejected him. The Lord goes on to say the Lord doesn't look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord knows us well, doesn't He? He knows that as His creations and as we find ourselves embattled by what society tells us, that we often fall to facial profiling. When we're looking for the best of the rest, when we're looking for the, those who have the best qualifications, we're inclined to see people from a purely external point of view, perspective. We're likely to favor those who are good looking on the outside. And, and that's according to our evaluation, of course, of what is good looking. But in facial profiling, what we tend to do is make these false assumptions only by what we see superficially, but not God. God is letting Samuel in on the way he makes decisions about people. And so it's not about how they look on the outside. Uh, it's not about the standing they may have in family or society. No, God says it's deeper. It's much deeper than that. Now we have lots of ways to say this, and we know this ourselves. Don't judge a book by its cover. Beauty is only skin deep. We might say appearances are often misleading, looks are deceiving. So we say all those things and yet we fall prey to facial profiling all the time. But now informed by God's standard, Samuel begins to make his way through all of Jesse's sons, looking at them one after the other and every one of them is rejected and now Samuel's exasperated. Well, I've been through all of them. Is this, is this it? Is this it? Jesse, is this all your sons? <laughs> and now in my sanctified imagination, when he's exasperated saying, is this it? In my sanctified imagination, this is where God points right over Samuel's shoulders and says, no, 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 no. There's another one. He's over there. The runt. You see the runt? That's the one I'm choosing. And it even comes out in the way that Jesse kind of responds to him. Because Jesse informs him, well, no, there, there's one more. There's David. I mean, he's out like tending sheep. He's out like doing his chores when actually both of those characteristics are part of the requirements of God's calling because they were exemplary of his heart in action. So we turn our attention to David. He's the, he's the youngest of these eight sons. David was viewed as, viewed as the least among these. He's a shepherd. Please remember, being a shepherd was only one step above being a slave. He was also left out of this celebration of consecration and sacrifice that Jesse had gathered his sons for before Samuel. No, no, no. He hadn't in, even been considered. He's a nobody. He's the runt of the litter that nobody noticed except God. Because God is seeing way beyond any physical or sociological uh, factors that are surrounding David. God looks into his heart and says this. This is the one. You ever felt like a nobody? You, you ever felt like nobody anybody needs? You ever felt like uh, nobody anyone would look to you for in terms of fulfilling a role for God? You ever feel like the runt of the world? Maybe even when it comes to a faith journey. If you do or if you have, I would say look out, be careful, because God sees differently. You see, God not only sees where we are, He sees who we can become. God not only sees where we are, but who we can become. David is called out of anonymity, 
out of insignificance, unimportance, out of inconspicuousness, out of obscurity. And that apparently is how God often operates when it comes to calling, yours and mine. But there's more to David's calling. David's calling happens when he is faithfully doing the tasks that he's been given, his everyday working job. He's a shepherd out in the field. It's made very clear here. He's working in the field as a shepherd. Again, only one level above that of a slave. David, while he is working, is faithfully doing his job to honor God. In the everyday mundane task, David is making this, this connection between what he's doing and glorifying God in what he's doing. Luke 16.10 reminds us of the importance of this. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. David was, well, David was busy. David was busy faithfully working. And I believe in this calling that that's a thing we need to understand that, that God calls busy, faithful people right where they're planted. Not in them looking for another place to be or another calling, but right where they've been planted. Are we? Are we busy being faithful right where we've been planted? Maybe we've been planted as a single parent raising children. Are we faithful where we've been, where we've been planted as a, as a student? Are, are we being faithful as an employee or an employer or as a, as a neighbor? Are we being faithful as a neighbor or perhaps even as a retired person? Are we busy being faithful regardless of the status of our position? Faithfulness to God is not qualified by where we are in life, but by how we're handling it, how we're living into it, how we're leaning into it, how we are being faithful given where we are. David's call, our call, goes even deeper. David's called without knowing the whole plan. Let me say as an aside, I hate this part. I hate this part. I'm kind of all for God's calling if you fill in the details. Can I get a witness? Lord, I'm willing to go if you'll tell me all the details. But here's the deal. This is where God's calling gets more than a little anxious for us. It's true for David. It's true for every hero of faith we've looked at thus far. There comes a point where they are simply called to go. And that's all the details they know. Go back to Abraham, 75 years old. Pick up. Take what you can and go to the land God will show you. No more details. It's a faith journey. You look at uh, Jacob. You remember Jacob who is called to return his, to his brother and seek reconciliation, to seek redemption. This is the brother he stole from. This is the brother he cheated. And so he's got to go without knowing how his brother's going to respond to him. So he goes. It's a faith journey. Re remember Joseph moving ahead day by day faithfully wherever he was, whether it was in a pit or in, as a slave or in prison and eventually as the second highest in authority over all of Egypt. He never knew what was coming the next day. It's called a faith journey. Remember Moses, 40 years in obscurity, doing what? Tending sheep faithfully. God says, go. And he has to make this decision. I I'm going to go, but I don't know the details. How in heaven's name is Pharaoh ever going to release the Israelites? And are the Israelites even going to follow me, God? But it's a faith journey. That's what makes it a faith journey. We don't have the details. And now we come to David, who has to go depending now on GPS, God's positioning system. I so want to trade it in for ways or Google Maps. But the problem is uh, we don't have that luxury uh, a bit of all the details being highlighted. We go, we begin our calling, we go without having the details of where the gas stations are. But we're pretty sure our tanks are going to run dry at some point spiritually. We have to make the journey without being alerted to accidents or traffic jams al along the way that may slow our journey. We have to go and start our trek without uh, being able to choose the fastest route to our destination, because guess what? We don't even know what the destination is. 
We have to travel our faith journey without the, the, the advantage of an ETA, an estimated time of arrival. We don't even get to choose the route without toll roads because we know more than likely there'll be a price to pay along the way. If we're not careful, we get so caught up in our anxiety about following this call simply to go without the details that we forget what God told Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 1, 4 through 5, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. You see, God is saying to Jeremiah, I've known you before there was a you to be known. Do you hear that? He, he, he's saying, before you were in the womb, before I even began to form you there, I knew you. I knew you, who you were, and who you would be. Before you were born, I consecrated you. Jeremiah, let's be aware of this. Jeremiah had done nothing to deserve this. David had done nothing to deserve this. This isn't about being deserving of the calling. God has set us apart for His calling before we were even us. And so it is for David. And for you and for me. God calls us based on His plan for us and the worth that He sees in us for who we can be. It is not to be determined our worth by the world around us because they are into, we are into facial profiling. God calls us out of our faithfulness to our everyday place of living and breathing and where we have our being and He calls us without knowing the entire plan. So David, like us, had to trust and what he was to trust and what we are to trust is that God knows when the perfect timing is for his calling of us. He's got all that figured out. Uh, this is another way of saying that, that God knows the whole plan. And we, Now listen, we often give him this in, in our little sayings. We say God is sovereign, he is absolute, he's supreme, God is omniscient, he knows all, he's a, a omnipotent, he's all powerful, he's everywhere. We say he's got the whole world in his hands. But when it comes to our calling, we often forget every bit of that. That when God calls us, we're reminded in Isaiah... 46, 8, he says, remember this and stand firm. Remember the former things of old. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Here it is. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done. God's timing. David doesn't have a clue. Talk about timing. We know the king who is in power, Saul. Well, he's declining in health and it won't be long before he falls on his own sword and takes his life. We know that Samuel, the great respected judge, was getting old, yet he was able to make this trek to see Jesse and to go through all of his sons in order to find David and anoint him. Oh, talk about timing. David was called before this great big bad war threw down with this group of people known as the Philistines because they had this big bad do dude named Goliath. Talk about timing. And perhaps here's the thing about David's calling that stands out more than any other. And that is that David's call was anointed with power from God. He's not doing it on his own. You're not doing it on your own. I'm not doing it on my own. We would do well to remember that God qualifies the called. He doesn't call those who have somehow already qualified themselves. He qualifies the called. He and He alone empowers the called by the power of God, the Holy Spirit. 1 John 2.20 says, But you, talking about us, but you have an anointing from the Holy One. We don't move into our own calling without this blessing from God so that we may fulfill what is said in Ephesians 3.20 which says, Now all glory to God who is able through His mighty power at work within us 
to accomplish infinitely more that we might ask or even think. We're not called by our own will. We're not empowered by our own power. It belongs to God and is given to us from God. And I think we would say, well, if God is in it, then no task is too big when God's power has anointed it. David's story teaches me so much about calling and tells me right where I am that as David, God will call when he sees our heart, when he finds us faithfully in the mon- what we might call the mundane task of living, breathing, and having our being, when we are busy doing the task of living at hand faithfully, he will call. And it'll be the right time, and you can be assured you won't know all the details. But this much is sure, he will give you, give me, Give us His power to fulfill the calling. So given all of this, now what? Well, what is God calling you to right now? I think you know what it is. I certainly believe and know that God knows what it is. In the middle of all this, calling us to to lay down our life, lay down our fear and doubts, and to trust the Lord God who does the calling. Calling us to another season, to another level of faithfulness. And He will provide, the Lord will provide everything we need. So, what is it God is calling you to? No. No. If you feel like the runt, perfect. Perfect. Pray with me. Again, Father, into this sacred moment where we have the opportunity because you have proclaimed your love, your power, your calling in every aspect of this service. What have you, what have we heard you say to each one of us? God, what are you telling me about my story now? 